Um, the first speaker on liver surgery is uh, Professor Edward Jonas, um, who is the head of the HPV surgical unit um, at Fruderske, um here in Cape Town. Thank, thanks, thanks, Ed. Um, thank you, Mark, for the introduction. Um, and thank you to the organizing committee for the invitation to join you for this very important meeting. I've got no disclosures. Um, as already has been mentioned, <clears throat> hepatocellular cancer um, in sub-Saharan Africa is highly prevalent in uh, most countries. It's the most common cause, one of the common causes of cancer-related deaths. The an uh, annual fatality rate is very high. That gives us an indication of the number of patients that we actually can uh, treat curatively. Uh, it presents at a younger age. A large percentage of um, the, 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 the tumors occur in non-serotic patients, an indication of the impact of chronic hepatitis B infection. Um, the patients more often present with larger tumors with um, metastatic and complicated disease. So if you look at the indications for liver surgery in general, um, in health systems, this is a study from the United States, you can see that um, malignancy is still the most common indication for liver resections and secondary or metastatic disease is by far the most common um, indication. Most of these uh, colorectal cancer liver metastases and primary hepatic malignancies, there would be HCC, uh, only 16% in this series. There's a paucity of data from sub-Saharan Africa um, this is just our own experience in Cape Town. You can see more than 80% of the resections we perform uh, for, of, of for um, uh, metast malignant disease. And six times more um, liver metastases are resected than um, HCCs. The role of surgery uh, is pretty well defined. Um, the um, Barcelona algorithm has already been highlighted. It's important to note that the Barcelona criteria are used in most of the, um, if you want to call it Western guidelines, but none of the, of the Asian guidelines actually include the Barcelona criteria in the treatment algorithms. So if we look at the role of surgery, you can see here it's for very early or early stage disease and basically sing single tumors uh, with a maximum dia diameter of, of uh, three centimeters. These, um, in terms of surgery, the guidelines are regarded as very restrictive and there's a lot of treatment going on outside of the guidelines. Um, within the guidelines, um, the, 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 the results in expert centers of ablation, um, resection and transplant are very similar, although lower recurrent rates in the, um, in the, res in the transplanted groups as already have been mentioned. And targets have been set uh, in countries with well-developed health systems for about 40% of patients with HCC to be uh, possible candidates for curative intended treatment. Um, these targets have been met in many countries. I'll just show you here some Swedish data from a Swedish um, liver cancer registry where in 2010 just about 30% 30 30 of patients or just under 30% of patients were treated with curative intent and that increased to almost 45% 10 years later. So in general, in high income countries with um, good health care systems, um, about 40% of patients may be candidates for, for curative intended um, treatment. Again, um, data from Sub-Saharan Africa uh, is very scarce. Um, we can get an indication of what's going on from this article. It was published in 1997 by Lewis Roberts Group um, basically cohorts uh, a retrospective study where 21 referral centers from the countries that are highlighted on the map there um, entered patient data into, into the cohort, uh, just over 2,500 patients. And of these, just about half of them were from sub-Saharan African countries. And you can see here that only less than 1%, only eight patients of this total cohort uh, were treated with curative intent, all of them uh, with resection, and none of them with local ablation or transplantation. And the reason why so few, uh, well, there's a number of reasons why patients are not properly treated, but I think one of the most important contributors to, to the status quo 
is that um, very few patients are diagnosed at a stage where curative intended treatment would be indicated. But still, if you look at the 5% patients, certainly more than eight of, the, of patients would probably have qualified for uh, curative treatment. This is in stark contrast to what is going on in high-income countries, where um, in this study from Germany already published in 2014, 40% of patients were diagnosed at BCLC stage uh, 0A or B. Um, I already showed you that we performed six times more resections for metastatic disease, most of them for colorectal cancer liver metastases, but also for neuroendocrine tumors. And if you take into account that about 25% of patients with colorectal cancer will have, um, will, during the course of the disease, have liver metastases of those, probably 20% that may be for curative intended treatment, you can see that we really still in this country um, also undertreat um, patients with HCC. The overall survival in this slide has already been shown. You can basically group it into uh, three groups. Uh, top of the, of, the, of the curves there is Taiwan, where the median survival hasn't been reached. So it gives you an indication of how well these patients are managed. Japan is not far after them. And then grouped in the middle there, you've got North America, South Korea, Europe, and China with um, um, survival rates comparable, median survival from somewhere around two years to, to three years. And then the bottom of the curve there, Egypt doing better than the rest of, of, uh, of Africa. And I think a um, number that is frequently mentioned that the median survival in sub-Saharan African countries for these patients um, being three, three months. Um, this was a landmark article. Um, I think still very impressive results. The randomization that was done in China in patients with chronic hepatitis B uh, infection or chronic hepatitis, uh, sorry, chronic cirrhosis, where um, patients were randomized between screening and non-screening. And you can see here <clears throat> in the um, surveillance group uh, that di uh, early uh, stage the disease uh, defined by what, a Chinese classific um, classification, actually 60% um, uh, um, of patients were diagnosed at an early stage and none of patients, uh, none of, of the patients in, in which there was a clinical presentation. Resection was performed in about half of the patients that uh, where the tumor was detected up, uh, with surveillance compared to 7% uh, in the control group and the five-year survival 50%, which is under 50% versus zero. Um, that's, uh, there's a number of randomized studies that have been done and, and meta-analysis, systematic reviews of these studies have confirmed these results. Um, this is the Swedish curve that I showed you on the left of the increase that, uh, that uh, ha happened over a 10-year period, 2010 to 2019. And you can see here that the proportion of patients in whom HEC was detected during surveillance actually perfectly match that, uh, that curve. So in countries with all the treatment possibilities uh, in place, the impact on um, getting more patients diagnosed at the stage when they can possibly be cured um, is really the impact of, of screening. So the optimal um, treatment algorithm for the management of HCC would be if all patients at risk are screened, that we pick up the disease early, that the diagnostic modalities are in place to confirm the diagnosis because we know it is imaging based, that patients can be straight, uh, can be um, staged properly, and that we, they can get the appropriate treatment. Does this work in sub-Saharan Africa? It's really a chicken and egg situation. In any debate about uh, screening and surgery, um, people would say that screening and, surgery and, and surveillance is really a waste of time because once these uh, patients are probably or may be diagnosed at a time when they can be cured, the treatment possibilities are just not there. And the other way around, that uh, we really don't need treatment for HCC because there is no screening and surveillance available and really to make an investment in treatment of a handful of patients is not worth it. And I think that led to the whole concept of resource sensitive, sensitive guidelines um, where uh, the treatment capability at a certain point would indicate what diagnostic capabilities are necessary to manage patient, 
patients and also which prevention strategies uh, are appropriate. And we talk here about primary, um, secondary and tertiary prevention. So countries are divided into those with minimal resources where hardly any treatment options are available, those with medium resources where resection and ablation is available but not transplantation, and then high resource, high resource uh, countries where liver transplantation is available as well as all the other modalities. So it come to, when it comes to a minimal resource situation where the treatment basically is best supportive care, the diagnostics needed is maybe an ultrasound just to confirm that there's a tumor, um, alpha photophytoprotein maybe to support the diagnosis. And in these situations, really the only um, prevention that would be appropriate would be primary prevention. Um, in other words, uh, for example, um, immunization for, for hepatitis B. Um, when it comes to minimal, um, sorry, medium resources where liver resection, local res and ablation is, is available, they will be, have to be supported by at least CT scan that can give you, can aid with a definitive diagnosis and also uh, can be used for staging. And in that scenario, primary and also secondary prevention would be appropriate. So uh, there is a place for uh, screening and surveillance programs. And obviously in high resource environments where everything is available, the international guidelines that usually do not cater for resource sensitivity can be followed. Um, diagnosis can be made according to the book and all um, the um, preventative um, modalities uh, would be appropriate. So if you go to the Lancet Commission's um, report on global sur surgery that was published in uh, 2015, you'll see that they've identified West, East and Central Sub-Saharan Africa as the countries um, in the world or, or the countries uh, in, these, in these areas with the highest unmet, unmet, need, uh, unmet surgical needs. And this is almost like a like a perverse um, coincidence that that's also the countries where the highest incidence of HCC on the continent occur. We did a uh, short surveillance in sub-Saharan Africa some, about six, seven years ago already, just to look at what is available in terms of treatment and diagnostic modalities. You know, it was very simple just sending out to a few contacts in these countries to hear what the situation is in the hospitals in terms of um, resources. So treatment um, in these, and we, we, we also asked about uh, private and state facilities, state facilities generally in, um, in sub-Saharan Africa, in these, including this country, are underfunded, and that is a very fertile growth for, uh, for private healthcare facilities, so we asked for both. So you can see liver resection was available in about 50% of facilities, ablation in about a third, no transplantation at that stage were performed uh, in, in any of these countries. Uh, diagnostic modalities were surprisingly more available, so both um, ultrasound and CT, MRI less so, but I think one has to recognize that um, availability doesn't mean accessibility. And you'll probably find one of these um, machines there for a whole hospital catering for all the uh, specialities and subspecialities. Um, what is the need for liver resection in sub-Saharan Africa? <clears throat> I think it is reasonably easy to do modeling um, we did that in, in this article that was published in three months ago, looking at the different regions. So our division is still the classical uh, way for sub-Saharan Africa, West, East, Central, and Southern Africa. Just an example of how we did this was we assume that there's, there are no patients at the moment being treated with uh, curative uh, intent or no, none are diagnosed at the at, uh, at a stage that they can be treated and that the ultimate target is 40%. If we assume that the, the yield of screening and surveillance is going to be linear and it's achieved in 10 years or 20 years, you can see there the number of patients that it will yield um, that will have to be catered for uh, with a possible curative intended treatment. So for West Africa, an annual increase of four patients in a million per million population and going down to 2.5, uh, 2.6 for, for um, Southern Africa. To perform liver surgery requires um, not only the patients, uh, there are issues with technical resectability, 
um, uh, that the surgeons have to be to, to consider to to determine whether a patient is um, resectable or not in terms of how much liver you can leave behind, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But also the oncologic criteria that we are limited with. Uh, we also need the personnel to do it and an infrastructure, um, as I've detailed there. And whenever this is discussed, there's really a very long list um, of, of obstacles and difficulties, I think, that face most of us um, from sub-Saharan Africa. It's very important to realize <coughs> that this is a disease that is not treated by surgeons. It's a disease that really will benefit from multidisciplinary management, and I want to <coughs> include prevention in that, although it's not directly treatment. Um, <clears throat> a big problem is that we know that good clinical services are supported by good research. Um, in this article published some years ago, um, it was shown that only that less than 1% of currently ongoing clinical trials are conducted on the continent. What I think is a little bit of a travesty. I mean, it's really a hotbed of HEC in the world and completely under-researched. Um, you can see an example here, hepatocellular carcinoma exploring the impact of ethnicity on molecular biology where the African continent is completely empty. So to conclude, and I've got a couple of more slides after that, <clears throat> I think the implementation of resource sensitive uh, management algorithms in SAA <coughs> is the way to go although the endeavor is eroded by geographical and within country economic limitations and variations in the quality and access and especially the accessibility of, uh, of health care. Uh, but, but at the same time, these uh, inequalities could be a powerful tool uh, <coughs> to bring about change and stimulate improvement of health care uh, specifically for HCC. And I think we can take a few cues um, from um, the, the whole drama, I almost want to call it, around um, uh, HIV around the turn of the century where people that treated these patients had to deal with politicians that were basically denialists that this wasn't a problem. Um, these slides actually should have been the other way around, but um, I'll just go fast. There was the, the, the meeting in Durban in 2000, uh, in, in 2000 about HIV that was really a turning point um, in the management of HIV, recognizing the impact that it had on uh, young people as HEC has in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And had, it was really a, a, an exercise, an example of how ad advocacy um, could have been used and also very young um, uh, patients that were uh, speakers at this conference. That actually gave, um, I think, uh, people something to think about, and this was Time magazine cover, not, uh, not um, much later than, than that meeting. Unfortunately, hepatocellular cancer, the public view of, of, of um, HCC is somebody that drinks too much, a lot of tattoos, a smoker, probably spends some time in jail, and I really think that is a complete misrepresentation of especially what is happening um, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So my last slide, <coughs> we are very happy that um, for the first time in, uh, since the, the, the start of this organization, the International Hepato Pancreatobiliary Association, there will be a meeting uh, on the continent of Africa, it will be in Cape Town in um, 2024, May, quite a nice month weather-wise. Um, the legacy topic for this meeting, as decided by the scientific community and the executive of the IHPB, is HEC. And not HEC, everything around it, HEC, including also um, the main topic of, of, of this meeting. A lot of organizations, including um, EASL, ASLD, and we also hope COLDA, uh, uh, we hope um, have got interest to join this meeting with combined symposia around everything that relates to HEC. Um, uh, at the same time as this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this excellent presentation.